<clears throat> I write for the New Yorker magazine. Um, I write narrative nonfiction. So the stories that I tell are true, but they're also very much stories, and I try and tell them as stories. So I started looking into the opioid crisis, and I learned that you know, it's this tremendously complex public health crisis that's unfolded over 25 years and, as was mentioned earlier, has killed some half a million Americans since the mid-1990s. But the origins of the crisis were actually less complex. In 1996, you had the introduction of a drug called OxyContin, and it was this groundbreaking new painkiller, uh, an opioid. That is to say, it derives from the opium poppy. And it was, it was prescribed in a different way than any opioid had been before. There was a huge marketing push to get more doctors to prescribe it to more patients more quickly for longer periods of time. And if the doctors had reservations about doing so, you know, historically the reservations about opioids were that they were potentially addictive. But with OxyContin, the marketing pitch was, it's not addictive. We've cracked the code. It's addictive less than 1% of the time. So OxyContin becomes this huge success. Since 1996, it has generated some $35 billion in revenue. It became the biggest blockbuster drug of its day. And if you look at prescription patterns in the United States, the way that doctors prescribe opioids totally changes with the introduction of OxyContin. They suddenly start prescribing them much, much more. And this is the birth of the opioid crisis. But that wasn't really what got my attention. What got my attention as I dug into this was when I learned that Purdue Pharma is not a publicly traded company. It's a privately held company, and it was owned entirely by this family called the Sackler family. And this really caught my eye. Because if you grow up in the United States, and I would say the same would be true for the UK, the Sackler name is all around you. You may not know who the Sacklers are, you may never have given them much thought, but if you open your eyes and you look around, particularly at art museums and universities, at elite institutions, you'll often see this name, Sackler, engraved in marble or in stone. And so that was how I started this project. It started as an article in The New Yorker in 2017. And then it became this book that has just recently been published. Um, and we'll talk about it. I, sh I should say, just before we, we get into the conversation, that the, uh, my ambition was to not so much to write a book about the opioid crisis. In fact, OxyContin isn't introduced until about halfway through the book. What I learned as I dug into the family history is that there's this incredibly rich backstory involving earlier generations of the family. So this is actually kind of a, a multi-generational family saga that starts in Brooklyn during the Great Depression with this immigrant family, these three brothers who grow up to be doctors, and then tells the story of their children and their grandchildren. So it really spans from the 1920s up until today and covers a, a history, a sort of a century of American capitalism. So I think I'm going to leave it at that, but I, I am eager for this conversation and then for any questions you have uh, about this or any of my other work, and i um, excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah. It makes it quite easy for me to start right away with the secular family. As you said, an, an immigrant family uh, just before the First World War, I think they, they came to, to Brooklyn from Ukraine, Poland, Eastern Europe. Um, the, the, the parents began a grocery store in Brooklyn, not too successful, I think. It was a difficult time, right? Um, and eventually these three brothers, Arthur, Mortimer and Richard, uh, go study medicine. W what happens in, in, in between? You have uh, these parents, Isaac and Sophie, who uh, come to the United States not speaking English. Um, and have these three boys. And it's, it's in some ways, I think, a, a quite archetypal story of American ambition. They want their children to thrive. They want them to make money. They want all three kids to become doctors. Arthur Sackler, the oldest brother, would later joke that by the age of four, he knew he would become a doctor because his mother kept telling him that he would become a doctor. Was there a particular reason why all three of them wanted to go into medicine? I think that the, the parents perceived medicine as a noble profession, mm -hmm. but also a very stable one. Right. Um, 
I think there was a sense that the, um, there's something unimpeachable about doctors. Why focus on him so much? He's an intriguing character, obviously. He's an art collector and everything. What, what makes him so important, even though he didn't even live to see OxyContin, you know, get big? He, I would argue, created the world in which OxyContin would later do what it did. So, so Arthur Sackler goes to medical school, but as a teenager, when his, when his family loses everything during the Depression, he's had to work. And the way he finds work is in advertising. He writes advertising copy, he becomes the advertising chief for his high school newspaper. And he ends up uh, going into the pharmaceutical business, but specifically into pharmaceutical advertising. And you know, if, if any of you have watched the show Mad Men, in the 1950s, Arthur is kind of the Don Draper of pharmaceutical advertising. He's, he's got this incredible grasp for how you sell medicines. And he realizes that you don't, it's not really the consumer you sell to, it's the doctor. Right. And you sort of seduce the physician because the physician writes the prescriptions. Let's go to OxyContin, which again was introduced in 96, uh, 1996, um, or it was admitted into the market. Uh, set the scene for us because the, the, the broad answer would be that there was a reconsideration going on of the way in which pain is treated during this period of time. Uh, there were many doctors who felt that, uh, certainly in the United States, in the UK, and elsewhere, that pain had not been adequately treated, that, that doctors didn't have a lot of education in pain, that doctors tended to think of pain as just a symptom of another thing and not as a condition in itself that they should aggressively treat, and that they were reluctant to prescribe opioids. And OxyContin came along just at the point where a number of doctors were saying, maybe we've been too conservative in our use of these drugs and we've let people suffer needlessly in pain. Um, maybe we should rethink this. So the timing was great. And then the other concern the company had was they had previously had a cancer pain drug and they said, you know, the problem is there's only so many cancer patients. Mm. Um, what if we could find a way to market this for other kinds of pain? Uh, chronic pain, not even just severe pain. What about moderate pain? That could be tens of millions of people. And that was what they wanted to position the drug for. So how do you do that? Well, you have to overcome the reluctance of physicians to do it, and so you claim that it's not addictive, which is what they did. So that was the marketing pitch. But what else did they do? I mean, how did they, how did they um, get these doctors um, to write you know, hundreds and thousands of, of prescriptions every year? So, so one of the critiques of the way in which pain had been treated was that doctors did not get a lot of formal education in medical school about the treatment of pain, and that was true. That was a totally legitimate critique. Um, the company hired hundreds and hundreds of sales representatives and uh, incentivized them in this interesting way. What they said was, we will give you bonuses. The bonuses will be pegged to the volume of pills that you can get doctors to prescribe. We're gonna track it all very carefully. And at every other pharmaceutical company, your bonus was capped. And at Purdue Pharma, it wasn't. So the more you get doctors to prescribe, the bigger your bonus is. And it gets to a point where you have people making like $200,000 a quarter. Um, they would keep track of how many prescriptions every doctor every pill. wrote. Every pill. Which also meant that the company knew that you know, when you had some little rural osteopath in a tiny little part of Pennsylvania, 100 miles from anything with a very small local population, and he's like fire hosing OxyContin in every direction, they knew because they had those numbers, that they knew that, that the volume of pills that they were selling in this area was totally out of proportion to the local population, and it's that times a thousand. They knew this everywhere because they tracked that data very carefully. I've done stories on OxyContin, and I think in Florida where at a certain time the, the pandemic was, I mean, it was hit pretty hard. And we went filming at, I think they called it a, a pill mill, basically yeah. just a, a doctor's office. But this doctor would have bodyguards, armed bodyguards who would bring him to his car as if he was some, some ma mafioso, basically. Was, was that common practice? This was more a, a, a mobster than a doctor, and you would see it all over. You always have crooks. Uh, in this case, there were many. Um... Doctors who essentially, you, you would, it's like a cash business. You know, you, people come in, they pay whatever it is that they, they give you 40 bucks and you give them a, a 
fake prescription. You give them a prescription for a condition they don't have, and then they go to a pharmacy. Sometimes the pharmacy was in on it too. The so doctors became drug dealers. In a the sense. doctors completely became drug dealers, and many of them ended up going to jail. Right. Uh, but what is interesting to me is that the company back in Connecticut that's making all the money, I mean, not making like $40 for a phony prescription, it's making billions of dollars every year, they're getting these reports from their sales representatives who are like, I did my call on the clinic in Florida. There was a line of 40 people outside the door. The parking lot is filled with out-of-state license plates. <laughs> it doesn't look like a doctor's office, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, when asked about this, subsequently, you know, people at the company would say, you know, it's not our job to judge how doctors practice medicine. Right. W when did the tables eventually t turn on them? In um, 2001, uh, newspapers around the country start covering what's happening because it's clear there's a big problem. Oxycontin's killing people in, in significant numbers. Um, there's a lot of crime associated with Oxycontin. The New York Times, I tell the story, Barry Meyer, who was an investigative reporter at the New York Times, who writes a series of really groundbreaking stories about this. So it starts to catch up with the company. In 2007, there's a federal criminal investigation in Virginia, and the company actually pleads guilty and pays a $700 million, $600 million fine. Um, but nobody goes to jail, and it doesn't touch the Sacklers. There's a lot of controversy around the drug and the company, but it doesn't catch up with the family. And this is what's so intriguing to me, is the family during this period is still giving money away, still going to ribbon cuttings, their name is still going up left and right. You know, they can show up at, at benefits and galas and nobody's asking them impertinent questions. But how is that possible? How is it possible that nobody made the connection? Happen. They had uh, um, scrupulously kind of distanced themselves in the public eye from the, from the company. They had very aggressive lawyers who anytime anybody started to think about writing about them, the lawyers came at them like a ton of bricks. They had PR spin doctors. I mean, there were these amazing emails that I got where <laughs> there would be some really awful article about Purdue Pharma and what happened at the company. And the article will get circulated internally at the company and they'll say, ah, oh, it's not too bad. They didn't mention the Sacklers till the end. Um, so there's a sort of strange sense in which the company takes the takes the brunt of the negative coverage and the, and the family is protected. There's a, there's a quote actually from a, a family lawyer uh, that I quote in the book who said, um, the objective is to protect the family at all costs. There's something almost kind of mafiosi about, about this, this uh, tendency. It, it maybe would have even helped the Sacklers case if they would have shown remorse in some sense, but they don't do it in any sense. I interviewed many, 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 many people who've worked for the family and known the family and worked at the company over the years. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's so startling is that um, there are people who told me, you know, I went to them 10 years ago and said, you give all this money away, what if you set up a foundation and put $100 million in it, which is nothing to you, right. and said, this is to help treat the opioid crisis, yeah. and it would have been, and, and they could have at that point then, they could today look back and say, look, for 10 years we've been doing X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think some of it is they don't want to acknowledge the opioid crisis, some of it is this, this desire to demonize the people, to essentially say, the people who get addicted to drugs, it's kind of on them, it's not, you know, nothing right. to do with us, so why would we show any sympathy? Some of it is a fear that they would appear to be conceding wrongdoing. Right, with, with that conclusion, does your book do you feel vindictive in a sense, or, or not at all? I mean, they, their, their name has been damaged forever, but would it then be fair to say that after this whole, whole saga um, that they came out of this pretty good? Yes, in terms of justice and accountability. It, and this money. Is a, this is a, and, and money. This is a story of impunity. You'll see that impunity is in some ways its subject. It was always going to end this way. The, this is a story in which the bad guys were always going to get away with it in the right. end. Right. Um, the one bit of solace that I think people can take um, comes from that story about Isaac Sackler, where he said, the, the most important thing that you can give a child is a good name. And money is fungible. You lose a fortune, you can earn another fortune. But if you lose your good name, you can never get it back. And the name is coming down. Patrick Gravenke. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah? That was great.